This video will introduce the basic techniques of symbolization in the system of predicate logic. Most people come to predicate logic having first worked in propositional or sentential logic. Those are two names for the same system. In propositional logic, simple sentences like Kermit is a frog are symbolized by a single capital letter, say F in this case since we've capitalized frog. And that's kind of the end of the story about symbolization in propositional logic. One simple sentence, one capital letter. The main difference from in predicate logic is that we're going to try to get more structure out of every individual sentence. And so for Kermit is a frog, it's not just going to be capital F, but it's going to be capital F followed by a lowercase k. F is standing for the predicate or property of being a frog. K is standing for the object or the individual called Kermit. Thus this is read backwards, Kermit is a frog. Now right off the bat you might think what idiot designed this system? Surely you ought to symbolize this capital K lowercase f. Well that might make some sense but that's not the convention. The idea here is an analogy with mathematics the predicates are being thought of as functions and they're operating on the constants which are named by the proper names. So Kermit is a frog is a function and this function assigns Kermit to the set of frogs. If it's helpful to think about that mathematical analogy that's great. If not, well then I will agree that this is, seems rather backwards in many cases but that's how one reads these couplets. Kermit is a frog in this particular case. Over here on the left we have all of the elements of predicate logic. First of all there are the predicates themselves. Predicates are probably best thought of as properties and they'll be symbolized with capital letters. Now the concept of a predicate in logic is not exactly the same thing as a predicate in English grammar in this particular sentence, is a frog is both the grammatical predicate and the logical predicate. However, as we will see in more complicated sentences, logic and grammar diverge and we won't always be talking about the same thing. So thinking about properties is definitely the best way to think about predicates. There are many, many different types of properties that uh, we could talk about. There's being a frog, being green, um, making jello, running a mile, enjoying logic, I mean we can go on and on and we're going to be very liberal about how we think about predicates. There's lots of peculiar things like uh, daydreaming about the nature of existence could be a predicate. Wishing that you had a million dollars last Tuesday could be a predicate. So we're going to be very liberal about what we allow ourselves to propertize if you'd like. Then there's the names. Names stand for individual objects. You can also think of them as constants in a mathematical sense, as we've pointed out, and they're going to be indicated by the lowercase letters a through w. We're going to stop at w because we want to um, reserve x, y, and z to play the roles of variables. Now, in a basic logic class where you only have one place predicates, as we're going to deal with in this class, then you will only get as far as x we won't need y and z. Um, you might worry, what happens if you want to talk about Xavier, Yertel, and Zorro? Well, in logic you just kind of avoid talking about those people most of the time. So once you know the basic ideas about how to symbolize Kermit as a frog, there's all kinds of sentences that you can symbolize and get more structure out of. Consider Socrates is a dead philosopher. This sentence actually has two predicates because it is talking about two properties and it's ascribing them to Socrates, being dead and being a philosopher. So when we symbolize the sentence, we're going to symbolize it DS, Socrates is dead, and PS, Socrates is a philosopher. Where's this ampersand coming from? Well, it's not that there's a synonym in the sentence that's requiring that ampersand. 
it's that there are two properties that we're ascribing to Socrates, and so we're saying that he has two properties, this one and this other one. Notice, in the sentences that we'll be covering, we will be dealing only with one-place predicates in this early material, and so all of the sentences that we symbolize will be couplets of an uppercase letter and a lowercase letter. I mean, you might have said, well, couldn't we do this, D and P, parentheses S? Well, that would make sense, I suppose, but that's not the convention in predicate logic. We always want to put the predicate with the objects that it's talking about. There's one more issue that we should talk about before we go on and talk about universal and existential sentences. And so let me get uh, Socrates out of the way here. When you're doing predicate logic, it's great to have in mind a picture that I call the world. Here is the world. The world is the set of all the objects that exist. Every single thing that exists is in here. There's Kermit right there. And uh, there's Godzilla. Godzilla is always hanging around in predicate logic worlds. Um, I believe uh, that would be Bambi. There's Janet. Uh, oh, it's, it's Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, all the philosophers. And look, over here, it's Mr. Table. And why? Well, it's all the boxes of jello in the world. And oh, there's, there's Houston right there. Um, and that's Radiohead. Every single thing that you can name is an object in the world for the purposes of this class. More technically, the world is sometimes called the domain, and in an advanced logic class, you might find it quite useful to shift domains. Instead of talking about the entire world, you might just talk about the domain of dogs, or the domain of cities, or the domain of really anything you want to talk about. But for our class, I think it's appropriate to, to start with the idea that we are talking about all the objects in the world. And so what the names do is they identify individual objects in the world. Now, there are a lot of things that exist, like all the boxes of jello. We don't normally give them individual names, but we could just for the sake of conversation. And so that's what we're doing when we're naming things, is picking out individuals. Now, what are the predicates? A great way to think about the predicates is as sets of objects in the world. So here is the set. I forget, let's see, Houston and Radiohead. Gosh, what set do they both belong into? Um, I guess this would be the set of objects which are strange. I, I'm not sure. Uh, there's the, the property of being strange includes all of the things which are strange in some way. Uh, here's Kermit and Godzilla, so that might be the property of things that um, are reptilian, or, you know, they're also in the set of... So, well, wait, Kermit's an amphibian. He's not a reptile. All right, well, you, you, get the, you get the idea. I'm not a biologist. Um, there's the sets. Here's philosophers. The sets, or rather the properties, correspond to sets. We'll illustrate this more as we look at further sentences. Okay, so let's get these out of the way. And now let's go on to the exciting stuff. Besides for getting more structure out of singular sentences like Kermit is a frog, we can also deal with universal and existential sentences. Those are sentences which talk about all things and some things. So in fact, what we have in predicate logic is two new connectives they're both called quantifiers. There's the universal quantifier and the existential. The universal stands for all things and the existential for some things. They're called quantifiers because they talk about quantities of stuff. But this is all getting too abstract. Let's look at an actual sentence. So consider this sentence. All frogs are green. This sentence actually includes two predicates. We're talking about the property of being a frog and the property of being green. Obviously, in grammar, we would think of frogs as the subject of the sentence, but since they're both properties for the purposes of predicate logic, 
They are both predicates. And what we're really asserting here is that there's a, prop, there's a relationship between being a frog and being in green, and we want to capture that relationship in our symbolization. Probably the easiest thing to do is to say, look, if you have a sentence that's talking about all things, then you're going to need to use this universal quantifier. The connective is actually a pairing between the upside down capital A and a variable. Now you could write for all Y or for all Z, but for typical purposes we just start off with for all X, and for all X is what we will see for over and over and over again. So this looks different than an ampersand or an arrow or a tilde, but it really just is a connective. Now in most of the sentences we're going to see, the quantifier is going to sit outside of set of parentheses, and it's going to be the main connective for the formula. On the inside, we're going to have a propositional connective, and when it's a universal, in all standard cases, it's going to be an arrow inside the parentheses. Now, all we have to do is insert our two predicates. And in this case, we're talking about the property of being a frog and also the property of being green. Now, we're not associating this with any particular name, like Kermit or Janet or Godzilla we're talking about all things and so this quantifier is going to range over these variables. Here's how we read this. The universal quantifier is always read for all x. So just like you read an arrow as if then every time you see this symbol you read it as for all x. So it, this formula says for all x if x is a frog, then x is green. We know that the if then, the arrow, is going to put an f, an if rather, right in front of the f. For all x, if x is a frog, then x is green. Now here's where the world comes in really handy. The world is the set of all the objects that exist. And the properties are sets. If you say for all x, if x is a frog, then x is green, what you're really saying is if you're in the frog set, everything that is in the frog set is inside the green set. So there's the set of frogs, here's the set of green things, and notice all the frogs are green. That's what our original sentence said, all frogs are green. It's great to visualize this as the set of uh, as the relationship between sets. So think about Kermit. Kermit is inside the frog set. Therefore, he's also green. Godzilla is not a frog. He is green. If Godzilla was a frog, then he would also be green. And notice this sentence is supposed to be true for everything. It's also true, say, for Janet. Here's Janet down here. Ah. Janet does not have the frog property, therefore she doesn't have the green property either. This is the basic sentence, the standard, I, I like to think of this sentence, all frogs are green, as the standard universal sentence. And this formula is the standard pattern which all of our universals are going to fall into. We will see that this pattern is sort of the core that we see over and over again as we're symbolizing sentences. Let's look at another example real quickly. Get rid of the world here, get rid of the sentence. Um, not surprisingly, there are some synonyms for all. They're mainly pretty, uh, pretty obvious. For instance, uh, every. Every, everyone, everything, these are kind of standard synonyms for all. And you might say uh, every philosopher likes jello. This is not a true sentence, but uh, you get the idea. How would you symbolize this? Well, as soon as you recognize you're talking about all things, you should get out your universal quantifier. And I really encourage you to go straight to quantifier plus some parentheses. And if it's a standard universal, then you know you're also going to have an arrow as the main connective inside. Now we just put in the properties. Associate them with the variable, px, jx, and we're done.
how would you read this back? For all x, if x is a philosopher, then x likes jello. All right. Let's also take a quick look at an existential sentence. Existential sentences are about some things. So imagine that we had the sentence, um, some frogs are green. Some frogs are green. How many is some? Well, in natural conversation, some probably means something like some small number, two or three or something like that. In logic, some equals at least one. That is definitely the best way to think about an existential sentence and to think about some. What this sentence is really saying from the perspective of logic is there's at least one thing that has the frog property and the green property. Well, if you're talking about at least one thing, then you're talking about an existential. So we're going to get out our existential quantifier. Like universals, they'll sit outside of parentheses to become the main connective for the formula. And then we'll bring down the predicates, fx, gx. What connective is going to need to go between the f and the g? Well, it will be an ampersand. And this formula will be read. Notice we read the existentials. There is an x. So this says there is an x. Oftentimes people throw in the little phrase such that. Sometimes I think this helps. Sometimes I think it just gets too wordy. But this says there is an x. x is a frog and x is green. Or if you prefer, there is an x such that x is a frog and x is green. Now if you think about the world, what is this sentence saying? It is saying, maybe the best way to illustrate it is as the intersection of two sets. Here's the set of frogs, here's the set of green things. And when we say there is an x, x is a frog and x is green, we are saying that there exists something in the intersection. There is an x such that it's inside both of these sets. So Kermit obviously is an example of something that's in there. Notice that the reason that these sentences are called existentials is because they do imply the existence of something. When you say that all frogs are green, from the perspective of logic, you don't necessarily imply the existence of anything. What you say is, if there's a frog, then it's green, but you don't necessarily assert that frogs exist. So existentials are called existentials because they assert existence. But the most important thing to take out of what we've done so far is to see that all the sentences that we're going to symbolize over the next couple of weeks are singular, universal, or existential. Singular sentences are about named individuals. If the sentence is talking about a, about a named individual, then you're not going to be using quantifiers in those sentences. Because at least for our introduction, we are going to keep these three types of sentences distinct from each other. Universal sentences are sentences that talk about everything in the world at the same time. All sentences, every sentences. Existentials talk about something, and some means at least one. If you have a singular, well, then they can have lots of different types of structure. But if you have a universal, in the vast majority of cases, it's going to have this basic structure. Existentials are going to have this basic structure. All right, for the rest of this video, let's run through the sentences. I've got three of them written down below here, but we've got a, a list of about 10 sentences that we want to go through together. Well, I checked the time, and I see that this video has gone on long enough. I think what I should do is designate this as an introductory video, and I will make a second video that will deal with these sentences and all the others that show up on page 5.2. I'll just call it 5.2, Answers 23 to 32.